right, so we have spent a significant portion of this unit on learning uh, discussing observational learning in particular. Now, when we were discussing things like classical conditioning or when we move into operant conditioning, those are typically behaviorist approaches. So they fall within the field of behaviorism, only look at observable facts and behavior, don't necessarily think about the thought processes that are factored into those. Uh, but when we move into social cognitive theory and observational learning, that's something a little bit different because in social cognitive perspectives, the theory is that you look at how behavior is learned and maintained by watching what others do, especially the positive consequences that happen to them when they act on those behaviors and the thought processes that factor into the actions themselves. So the plans that are implemented, um, the expectations of how those behaviors will go over or what will happen to you if you act on those behaviors and just the beliefs that you have about it in general. So because people differ in attitudes and expectations and perceptions, they can go through the exact same event and come out with completely different lessons from it. And we've discussed this before. We talked about it in the sense of the first unit test you guys took in this semester. Two students didn't study, go through taking the test and they both fail. At the end of it, one student comes out with that experience and they recognize, okay, I should have studied more. I'm going to try a lot harder for this next test. Another student, on the other hand, they go through that exact same experience with the exact same results. However, their perception now becomes, well, this class is really, really hard. I obviously don't understand it, so I'm just not even going to try. I'll just bide my time and sit through the semester and then get done with it. Okay, so it's very possible for that structure to happen. And so it's important to, according to social cognitive theorists, not only look at behavior the way that behaviorists do, but also to look at the thought processes as well, because those very, do, those very much do influence how a person will act on behaviors and why. So within social cognitive perspective, we then have observational learning. This is simply just having a relatively permanent change to our behavior because we watch what happened to another person after they carried out an action. That's all that definition means. So often this is referred to as modeling. And if you think about it, it makes sense. It's basically a scenario of imitation or monkey see, monkey do. You watch what happens to another person, you follow in kind. Um, so some examples of this are you know, driving a car. You watch your driving instructor. If your parents take you out, you watch them and how they maneuver through things. Uh, playing a sport. If you have an older sibling that played football, you want to play football as well because you saw what they did and how successful they were at it. Um, or even just writing the alphabet when you were younger. Your teacher would trace it up on the board for you and then they would have you write it out in, you know, in the aftermath of that and model how they did it. So that's observational learning. Now, the big key thing that I want to bring our attention to within observational learning is kind of the cornerstone theoretical experience that happened with observational learning, and that is through Albert Bandura's Bobo doll experiment. And I'm actually going to show you guys some video of the experiment um, just so that way you can see how significant the findings happened to be because what he did was he wanted to test just how significant modeling could be in terms of influencing a person's behavior and thought processes and he wanted to look specifically at children in this situation so he took two groups of little kids and you're going to see them they're toddlers all the way up to about six years old and in group one, he had the children watch a film of a student of his, um, she was a female, um, beating up a blow-up clown doll named Bobo. Okay, and she did it very violently. She took a mallet to it. She would throw it on the ground and start punching it. She would kick it across the room. Okay, and so they watched her attacking this Bobo doll. And then at the end of the video, the woman was given a reward in the aftermath for it. And so in group two, you had the control group because this was another group of children who were around that you know span of toddler age and they watched the exact same woman 
carrying out those violent acts. However, instead of getting treats, she was actually punished and reprimanded for carrying out that activity. So, group one sees her rewarded for the violence, group two sees her punished for the violence. One can only imagine what the results end up being because it turns out that the kids in group one very much em end up imitating the actions carried out by that female student down to the mannerisms of how she would hold her mallet or how she would throw it down on the ground and punch that doll. And so it's very important that you recognize that this was very influential in establishing much of what we know with regard to observational learning and how we very much are prone toward looking at what happens to others and watching and imitating in kind. It's important to note, especially since we've been looking at all of the violence that is portrayed in the media through shows like Criminal Minds, these kids are of the age where we talked about that research that was done back in 2004. Children between the age of 5 to 15, so for many of you that was just only last year or two years ago, you are bombarded with 13,000 violent deaths on TV in that 10 year span. And that doesn't include movies or video games, which certainly uh, increases the amount of violence you're exposed to. So what I would like to show you guys now is a about a five minute clip of Albert Bandura's experiment and just how influential it was. <laughs> Very funny.
Okay, so you just got to witness some of the actual footage from the Bobo doll experiment. Um, you heard me refer to the little girl that ends up being pretty um, obviously influenced by what the female student ended up carrying out on Bobo. I've referenced Susie multiple times to you. I told you I would have a picture of her holding a mallet, and here it is. So she was that little girl that was featured in that video. Okay, and if you noticed, for those little kids, they copied almost down to the exact mannerisms that the female student used when she was carrying out those violent acts. So um, Bandura's results from those studies that when kids were left alone, um, the kids in group one would attack the Bobo doll just like they had observed has had very, very significant um, impact with regard to how we perceive violence on TV in particular and just in the media in a general sense, which is what we've been looking at for the past several days. Um, and so it's very interesting to think about it in terms of what does this say, this research, when we let kids watch violence on TV. Between that 10 year span of five to 15, 13,000 violent deaths witnessed on just TV alone, okay? And so it really makes us wonder, can children end up imitating what they see on TV and does it make them more violent? Um, because combined levels of research in the aftermath of Bandura's experiment show that the greater your exposure to violence in the media, on, in movies, on TV, uh, the stronger the likelihood that you will behave aggressively. Okay, and so that's something that we discussed in class with one another. We're not saying that you're going to go out and become, you know, violent murderers, but there is research out there to prove that it, prove that it makes one more aggressive or more inclined to act on aggressive thoughts and feelings. And this is even after we take out social class, so whether you were raised in Indian Hill or over the Rhine. Uh, and, you know, intelligence levels, whether you have an incredibly high IQ or not, and, and other levels of factors such as gender, okay? And so they found that grade, grade school kids who cut back on the amount of time they spend watching TV or playing video games, their aggression level actually declines pretty significantly. And so it's some real food for thought because I know that many of you guys have a difficulty accepting this research. But there is a lot of it out there to prove that there is some truth to, you know, an increased likelihood in watching violence and becoming aggressive yourself. And so, you know, at the end of the day, though, we do have to look at the other side to this, which is what many of you guys have gotten on to. Um, this correlation isn't strong enough for people to worry about. You guys play video games, you watch TV, you watch movies that are violent. You don't necessarily act on them in the exact same manners that they carry them out in the media themselves. And furthermore, we also imitate positive activities too. Um, you know, and, and interestingly enough, we imitate those that have reinforcements given to them. So if positive activities are reinforced when we're watching what others do, we'll imitate what's been rewarded and we'll avoid the stuff that's been punished. So it's very similar to what happened in group two. When group two was uh, witnessing the woman be punished for her actions, they weren't as inclined to carry out the violence. Um, and so think about your siblings, how you guys have a tendency to watch one another, whether you have younger siblings who watch you, or you were a younger sibling and you watched an older sibling and saw what happened to them. We learn from what they did um, and were rewarded or punished for, basically. And not only that, but we'll imitate those who um, operate on behaviors that we feel that we could also perform successfully. Okay, so we call that self-efficacy. If we believe and we have a perception that we can carry out something and do something successfully, you know, so that whether that's um, you know build a race car um, or to you know try out for a soccer team or to play a particular sport will be more inclined to carry that out. And so that does have some levels of positive consequences attached to it. And so it is important to note that even though there is that research out there that says that we will observe and oftentimes mimic what we see where violence is concerned, we also mimic the positive as well. And so that's very important to notice too.